Hello, Zero K fans, and welcome to the December 1v1 tournament. This is actually the first tournament in a long time, and it's really good to be back. Anyway, I am your host, Shadow Fury 33, or Dominic, as I'm now calling myself occasionally. And we are just waiting on the first few matches, so the first little bit is going to be Swiss. There's going to be several rounds of Swiss. I'm not entirely sure how many, because channel launch generates it automatically, but it looks like at least seven. So we'll have seven rounds of Swiss, followed by a best of four tournament to determine the winner based on the Swiss results. And for now, we are going to be setting up with what I want as the first game, Pokemoko and Dimefreund. I believe this is going to be one of the more evenly matched games, and also they are players we have seen quite a bit, so it seems like a good way of easing into this. Because there are quite a few players here which I haven't seen in a long time. I can't think of any players offhand except maybe Zinyu who I've never seen at all. But definitely a lot of players who look reasonably, well, newish to people watching the tournaments. It's certainly not something that we've seen as much in my exhibition match casts. So, I'm really excited. I mean, just considering that we are going to be seeing a lot of new players, we're going to be seeing a lot of new faces, or at least in tournaments, for, or at least for this stream, we're going to be seeing a lot of possibly new playstyles. Because Zero K is something that hasn't really gotten a huge amount of competitive attention in the last little while. Be nice to get back to seeing that come up and be more relevant overall. Now, I expect at first we are going to see largely fairly normal strategies. You know, you know, get your factory, you expand pretty normally, you get a second factory, usually an air factory. Just try to take all the space you can. That's a pretty typical setup. I mean, that's how... I would say it is safest to play. But we could see another QB. We could see someone going for really weird factor strategies, someone going for weird stra commander strategies, possibly someone going for weird defense strategies, though I question how well that would work, but it would be interesting, to say the least. But I have no idea. Like I said, the Hokumoko versus Dimefriend, that is likely to be a fairly normal game. There's no reason for me to believe that it's going to be a game that has really anything different about it. Like, it's we've seen Hokumoko a lot, we've seen Dimefriend a lot. It's pretty clear how this works. And they're going to be playing the economy game, they're going to be playing some little long game. Dimefriend might be doing something a little bit weird because they occasionally like to do something a little bit weird. But I don't expect we're going to be seeing too much out of the ordinary. Just solid play from players who have plenty of experience, who know exactly what they're doing. And I believe the first, first round is going to be on Quicksilver. Which I haven't seen in a long time. It's not even the map maker. Or sorry, the matchmaker. It's just... It doesn't really exist. Largely, I think, due to performance issues, though. It is also a bit of an odd map that weirdly favors both jump and... And light vehicles. It's a flat map, so it favors light vehicles, but at the same time, it's got a few really steep cliffs. Thus, jump bots come up. But it's also too big to make spiders work. So, a little bit weird. It's one of those maps. One of those strange and wonderful maps that exists that makes you wonder just sometimes how this whole thing is supposed to work. But it's pretty cool. At any rate, we have... Uh, let's just... You know, we're just waiting for the players to start, and we have... I believe the start of the game in a second, once Dimefriend is ready. There it is! Alright, I don't know why I'm going into the technical issues, but we have... We have a game! First game in the tournament! It is... Hokomoko vs. Dimefriend on Quicksilver. And this map is, yeah, it's always looks good. Can't say I can argue with it. So, like I said, this is a flat, this is a somewhat flat map where the main areas and the main bases are reasonably easy to defend thanks to the ramps. But at the same time, there's like this really notable cliff here, as well as here, the map being radially symmetric as it is. And that 
does give a lot of favor to jump bots. So oftentimes it's recon commander jumps down here, builds a light vehicle factor in the lower ground. That's often how we see these things progress. And of course, like all maps, we could see a Cloakbot Factory as well, because Cloakbot Factory is basically viable on everything. And Dynfriend, are you gonna you are not gonna go ships on this map? Like, regardless of whether or not the water damages you, there is no way you I could see a ship build working here. There's just not enough connected water to make that work. That would be interesting though. I mean that would be an interesting thing to see if I don't think even though I don't think it would be a particularly viable thing to see. It would be kind of cool. Not gonna lie. But anyway, we are it. We are going Hokomoko, going for the exact strategy I was talking about before. Reconcom into Light Vehicle, or, or Dime for going Reconcom into Cloaky. Actually, I haven't seen it. Yeah, there it is. There's the Light Vehicle, or Rover Assembly. So into rovers, straight off the bat with some builders, because that is what you do on this map. However, Dime Friend deciding instead going for Glaze offhand, which, I mean, to me, makes a little bit more sense. But Hokomoko, no, they're going to go for the Mason, they're going to go for three Scorchers. They, they want the more economic build right off the bat, not too worried about being harassed, which may not be the wisest worry, as we are seeing Glaive coming in right here. It should be able to take out the Mason, no problem. And that is the most crucial target, because that Mason goes down... It's going to be another minute or so before Hokomoko is able to take the top. And that is indeed what's going to happen. Hokomoko losing their Mason right off the bat. They've, I mean, they've got very little in terms of overall economic expansion potential. Their commander can jump back up to the top, the high ground. That is likely what they're going to do, considering they can't get a worker up anywhere near quickly enough. But at this point, they don't seem to be especially concerned. Granted, they don't have a huge amount of resources on hand, so I can't say I'm surprised. Still, though, Hokomoko is going to be behind in the mid-game when it comes to economy, assuming we don't see another Mason come up and very rapidly start expanding, which we currently will be, but it's not coming up yet. We do have the one Scorcher up, another Scorcher coming up for Hokomoko, and that is going to be pretty much all Hokomoko has to maintain any presence around these Masons. So I would expect we are going to see Hokomoko's commander jump up here just to fill out the high ground. At the same time, though, Hogamoko not able to get a whole lot of attack power into Dimefriend, not a whole lot of retaliation. So Dimefriend able to freely take that top ground, able to get an extra six metal per, uh, four and a half metal per second, and that is going to be a sizable advantage into the mid game, considering just that's a one and a half percent or one and a half times advantage, fifty percent advantage on the economy is nothing to sneeze at. It looks like at this point. Just have Hokomoko trying to find some way around. Some way to get around this increasingly large horde of glaives Dimefriend has prepared for them. At the very least, managing to get the pressure on to keep, to keep the Mason alive. That's the big thing. The problem, however, is that there is already a glaive on the high ground. So this Mason, it's not going to have an easy time of it if it's trying to stay alive up here. And I don't see Hokomoko putting any resources to protecting that Mason up in the top. And I... I don't expect this is going to go any different. Hokomoko looks like they're about to lose a second worker thanks to this. At the same time, though, able to get rid of all of Dynfroin's glaives. Still quite effective. Of course, the question now is, can they live? Can this Mason live long enough to get to the bottom? No, it can't! Scorchers will be able to at least pressure this glaive, maybe not kill it. If they managed to kill that, it'd be at least something. At least the third Mason would be able to get to high ground. But at this point, Hokomoko has lost two Masons already. I'm a bit surprised, actually, they did not expect to have a Glaive there, because for anyone playing Cloakbot Factory, that's kind of what you do. You send Glaives around the map as a scouting force, you just put them on anything, and if workers come in there, they die. It forces your opponent to have a military escort with every single worker, slowing down their expansions. I'm a bit surprised Tokomoko didn't think about that, but I guess they just didn't. It's a bit of an oversight, but it's understandable, as one. Pokemon, however, at this point, figuring they just have to go for it. Going for what they can. Getting rid of a few metal... Or trying to get rid of a few metal extractors, but time frames on point. Got the Glaze on defense, and that is going to be perfect. Gonna handle everything. So at this point, Dying Friend is basically on top. They have an 8 metal advantage. They have not quite enough energy to make that fully work, but they're not accessing either. And Hokomoko has no real plans to expand other than using their commander at the front lines and hoping for the best. So, right now, Hokomoko is just in a tricky spot. They can't take their top ground. They can't take much of the center without potentially risking Glaze coming in on all sides. They've got a bit of a position on one of the lanes into the center. 
but that's out of four. So it's it's not going to be the easiest thing to do to keep Diamond Friend out of Hokumoku's expansion attempts. However, Diamond Friend is going to be unable to stop Hokumoku's current expansion attempt as they just haven't set any resources to do so. At the same time, Hokumoku is doing what they can to stop Diamond Friend from expanding, which is actually being surprisingly aggressive. I mean, surprisingly aggressive to the point that, that losing Scorchers for not a whole lot of value. I do like the use of the commander for that, especially with Machine Gun coming out there. But it's... It's going to be tricky. I almost kind of wish that that commander had gotten the Missile Launcher or the Rocket Launcher just to make it easier to deal with Riot Units. But at the same time, I guess more so to deal with the Ronin coming in here, the Skirmishes coming in, which will be a much larger problem going forward. All right. All right. No. At this point, though, at least there is hope of getting rid of one of these. The Conjurer possibly going down to a, to a picket. And it looks like it's going to be a bit of retaliation from Dying for me to stop that coming in because, of course, can't allow the creeping defenses. You let that in, and you're basically screwed. So, Okamoko, while they are able to maintain a bit of front pressure, they, they're not really able to push in too hard. And considering the fact that they do have an economic disadvantage, I can't say I'm surprised. That being said, though, they are evening that up pretty effectively, and Dying Friend, they have not been expanding over to the northwest. The Hokomoko might be able to turn this around in mid-game as they take all of these metal extractors with no competition. Nothing even coming in to even try to contest. So Dying Friend, while they do have this one warrior that's making a bit of a show, doing quite a bit of damage, actually, we'll be able to get rid of this Mason with no issue, possibly get rid of quite a bit of the main base as well. If it weren't for that, I would say that Dime Friend was going to be falling behind hard in the mid-game. At this point, though, it's it's hard to tell. Dime Friend did manage to get a bit of harassment in, but hasn't really managed to get a whole lot of damage in. They are, however, forcing the commander back, and they broke the line! So unless these Scorchers can do enough damage to get rid of the Ronin and essentially fully discourage Dime Friend's assault, Dime Friend should be able to come around the side. They probably suspect that Hokumoko has built up over to the eastern side, and indeed they have! I wish when it occurs to me that I forgot to actually make sure that the stream wasn't entirely snipeable. I'm going to have to do that after this match, but my apologies. It's been a while since I've done a tournament. So I don't think that is the reason. Regardless, Hokomoko throws in the towel. Dying Friend takes it. <clears throat> and for those of you who may have been on the stream a while before, kind of understand how this goes, we have a towel. We have a towel emote. So if you want to throw the towel, feel free to do that. Just an emotes tab. Now, that is that, though. The most important thing is that that match is over. So we're going on to whatever match is next. However, being that this is a Swiss tournament, we are going to have to wait for the remaining matches to finish up. I will see what I can find in terms of other matches as we go, because I'm pretty sure... We will have other matches ongoing that are probably not that far in, considering it's only been about 10 minutes. I think we have something... I've got, let's see, what else is there? Now, the top guy and King's Dad could be pretty good. But it's all a question of what has been completed. Because, of course, that was a single match. What else is there? Let's see, eight minutes, eight minutes. Mm. All right, let us check out. Let's check. Uh, I think Top Cat and King Stat is also done. So we are going to be going up to. Let's see, Anir versus 400. Because Nier versus 400, that is going to be, I think, also a reasonably even match. I mean, to be fair, that last one was a more, more one-sided than I expected. My bad. But, let's see. 400 on to similar thing. Top ground? Ooh, top ground. Look. Interesting. And Nier again going for the bottom. Or top ground, light vehicles. And we're seeing a very even game here where... Anir is able to take all the high ground. Actually, both players are able to take the high ground with very little issue with contesting it. Very little issue with their opponents getting in their way. And a much more robust understand or much more robust handling of the full terrain. So at this point, we're seeing what happens when you don't start in the low ground. Instead, pick the high ground. 
It's a bit harder to project your power from, but at the same time, it's way easier to defend and way easier to maintain an economic base. You don't have to worry about getting surrounded on all sides. You don't have to worry about losing this top ground to one glaive hanging out in their back lines. Now at this point, Warren and Anir are both relatively even when it comes to economy. Anir in a bit of a well, slight advantage overall, especially with this harassment coming in over to the north. Able to get rid of quite a few of 400's mental extractors. Possibly able to get rid of the commanders. The commander is out in the open. They do have a Faraday coming in. It should be up in time. It will stop about half of this, these Scorchers. If it gets up in time, and there is the stop, but unfortunately it also stops the commander killing all of it. Again, I stress, commanders explode when they die. It's best to avoid getting hit by that explosion. But regardless, I near managed to get rid of 400's commander right there, getting rid of the storage that they had, and getting rid of a fair bit of their economy, putting Anir at a fairly sizable advantage overall. Largely to reclaim, but still, an advantage is an advantage. So 400, scrambling at this point to try to get themselves back into position, economically speaking. They already lost a bunch of their metal extractors prior to that attack on the commander. And at this point, they've basically just got to set themselves up to hold off against the Ravagers coming in afterwards. The thing is, Anir doesn't have that much of an economic advantage yet. I mean, as it stands, they're fairly even. Fairly even in terms of metal value destroyed, fairly even in terms of economy. What advantage there has has not really manifested into the units yet, but it will shortly. However, with 400 getting a slight advantage when it comes to units destroyed, a considerably growing advantage considering units destroyed, 400 should be able to manage despite the fact that they just lost their commander. They've rebuilt the storage, they're getting their metal extractors back up. They only have a couple, couple builders doing that, but they also have the gunship plant coming up, which is a bit of an interesting turn. They clearly have enough units to defend as it is, so they don't have to worry too much about anything coming in from Anir. But at the same time, they did lose the Northwest. Anir will be able to take all that. That's another six metal per second for Anir. And once that happens, well, there's not much left. Like, once that happens, Anir is basically going to be able to take this without too many issues. Of course, that's assuming that 400 is not able to hold on past what I'm looking at right now. Because if 400 gets the gunships up, Anir has very little to deal with that. The Scorchers will help a bit against any Locusts that come up, but if, rape, if Harpies come up, that could be a problem. That could be a massive problem. That could still put Anir in a very backfoot position. While 400, they have to deal with all this stuff here. Thank you, chat, for the blessings. Yeah, I still have a cold. But anyway, that's for 400. They are going to be... I mean, if they can hold off, get some air support, manage to get rid of quite a bit of Anir's army, which they are even doing just with static defenses. Like I said, they're being very efficient at dealing with Anir's army, and Anir's 4 metal per second advantage is not doing them a massive amount of favors when they're losing their army as much as they are. The question, of course, can it be maintained? This, the defense is coming in here, not much that's stopping them from dealing with all of these metal extractors. Yeah, all these metal extractors. Stardust is being built up, but that is nowhere near the range required. I mean, fencers will outrange it. That's part of the point of a skirmisher is to get rid of riot units, and the Stardust is essentially a warrior on a stick. And that is, of course, going to be completely destroyed by the Fencers. But at the same time, the Fencers are getting surrounded by the by Ronin. I'm a bit surprised. I'm not sure how well this will work because these are kind of slower units. If it were Glaives, I could maybe see it. As it stands, though, Ronin on their own are not really enough to get rid of this entire force. So, again, 400 losing the lower ground metal extractors. But again, we see the value of having the defensible top line. And indeed, we are seeing Locusts, which is an interesting choice. I mean, the Scorchers... They have a bit of a time getting at them. Levelers definitely have a time getting at them. A good time getting at them. And fencers are just completely untouchable. Like, it, fencers are flex AA. It is very much worth noting. And I think Anir is probably clued in that 400 is likely gone for air because 400 doesn't have enough of an army. Considering that 400 still has a strong economy, Anir is probably clued in that 400 doesn't have a bunch of cloak bots, which means they're building something else. And 1v1 being what it is, that's probably something aerial. And if, since it's not entirely certain, we aren't going to see any crashes for the time being. But fencers are still going to be coming out. Actually, I don't think we're going to see any crashes. And it looks like no, we are not at all on it. So that's not likely to happen anytime soon. But at the same time, we do have an airplane coming in from Anir. So just in case, just in case the Locusts are managing to get a bit of position... Just in case they manage to deal with some of Veneer's army, there is going to be a boatload of Swiss. 
And those Swifts are going to be causing problems. But at this point, Aenea, they've taken over the main map. They've taken, they're have taken they taking the southeast. They took the northwest earlier. And now the southeast under their belt, they're not going to have a whole lot stopping them from just completely taking this game. I mean, the Locusts weren't a terrible idea, but unfortunately that was when 400 had a much stronger economy. Because before they lost all the time, and I do like the fact that they are using the Locust to at least stem the tide over the Northwest. But without a Wasp or any other builder coming into the Northwest to try to take that back, there is not much that 400 is going to be able to do, considering Anir's massive economic advantage and the fact that Anir has gotten a fairly large attrition advantage as well. Over a thousand metal in attrition advantage. Considering that Anir has had an economic advantage for the last five minutes, that is a deadly combination that could spell doom for 400. But 400 is managing to at least get a little bit of momentum, getting rid of a few metal extractors here and there, and turning that into potentially another army wipe from 400. I mean, they have the perfect composition to deal with the Ravager. The Scorcher, not so much. The Scorcher is causing loads of problems. If the Locusts come, come in here, that might be worth it, but regardless, the, Ro the Ronin managing with some attrition to get rid of the Scorchers. The Ravagers will fall soon after. Or should fall soon after. It's actually a fast unit as well, so it's, a, again, a difficult thing to call. But at the same time, with the Hawks coming in here to stop the Locusts from managing to get a whole lot of momentum in here, that is going to completely stuff 400's air control game, and with that, I think 400 is likely to throw in the towel. We could see something coming out of this, but considering the Locust essentially is going to be fighting against a dozen Flex AA units, on top of everything else, on top of the fact that there's not a whole lot of army coming in, and these running valiant effort from them, they should be able to get rid of a few fencers, but it's only going to go so far, especially with the Hawks coming in here getting full air control, and when you have full air control like that, the next thing you do is build bombers. We should see Ravens and or Phoenixes up very shortly, if it even comes to that. I think it might just be air control to stop the Locusts from doing anything, and then the fencer Ravager combo to finish off 400. And with the economy they have, they realize there's nothing left. Throwing in the towel, that is the match. So, it's, I mean, much closer. Definitely a closer match. We came in here, and it was neck and neck. And it was really just because of the loss of the commander. Just put 400 on the back foot. And then choosing to go from there in a position of slight economic disadvantage to building up the gunship plant, while an interesting move, and they managed to get the economy and attrition to make that work at the time, it clearly didn't pan out as well as I'm sure they would have liked. So, good games. Good game in the 400. That puts 400 up a round, and we are, in fact, I believe, just about done round one. We're waiting on Google Frog and Nemo to finish their match. But once that's done, we will have a completed first round of this Swiss tournament. Actually, considerably faster than I expected as well, considering, but hey, that's good. That's what I want to see. I mean, reasonably quick tournaments. Always a good thing. So the one thing is, though, is this going to be... Oh, oh. The one thing for me, though, is this going to be a longer tournament just because we do have this many rounds or is this going to continue as this is because the thing is as we go forward we are going to get increasingly even matches these last few matches were a little bit uneven you had a few times where some players were obviously kind of randomly sorted so it's always hard to say just how even it's going to be but that is likely to stop very shortly one or two rounds in everything even is up so it should be much more exciting as we go forward We'll get to that when we get to that. So until then, have a short break while we wait for round two. And stay tuned until we get back. <laughs> 